This episode of Outside the Rack is brought to you by Kinetic Performance, the makers of the leading tool to measure barbell performance, the Gym Aware. There is obviously a reason that the man who wrote the book on velocity-based training, Dr. Brian Mann, calls the Gym Aware the Rolls Royce when it comes to velocity-based training measuring devices. And that's because it ticks a lot of boxes when it comes to being able to measure and monitor your athletes that you get to work with. Working in velocity-based training at this time, of course, this is the tool to use. You're going to be able to take the guesswork out and have target zones set for your athletes so they're ready to roll. Power and strength analysis, yup, tick that box as well. Power drives the fastest sprints and breaks the hardest tackles, and you'll be able to make sure you're in the right zones with each lift when using the gym aware. So hop on over to kinetic.com.au today to learn what Evan and the team have in store for you with the gym aware. Being a practitioner in the world of sport performance is a challenging situation. We're in a spot where you're always asked to search for more. But more what? What are the questions that most practitioners in the world of high performance are asking? Well, where can I find cutting edge information? Where can I find different opinions and different ways of doing things and different feedback that I can get on the training that we're utilizing? And where's a place where I could find like-minded individuals to give me solid advice when it comes to my career development? This is precisely why we built the Strength Coach Network. Within the Strength Coach Network, you're going to get exclusive content monthly from some of the top practitioners in the world, bringing you the most cutting-edge information. You tie that in with a forum where you're able to connect with coaches around the world to bounce ideas off of, to learn from, and to get career advice from, and you've got your sensational one-stop shop for all things career development for strength and conditioning coaches. So hop on over to strengthcoachnetwork.com slash CVASPS. That's strengthcoachnetwork.com slash CVASPS to dive into all that great content today and get your 48-hour trial for only a dollar. I look forward to seeing you in the Strength Coach Network. What's up, everybody, and welcome to the sixth episode of Outside the Rack, brought to you by Kinetic Performance, the makers of Gym Aware. Again, in this show, we're trying to dive a little deeper into the minds of some of the top practitioners in the world of sport performance to, little bit, to learn a little bit more about who these people actually are and how they got to where they are today. Today, we are joined by the Assistant Director of Strength and Conditioning at the University of Colorado Boulder, Adam Ringler. Adam, thanks for joining us today, man. Jay, thanks for having me on, man. Uh, humbled and privileged. Man, stoked to get this one down, buddy. It's... Uh... We get to talk about a lot of the neat stuff, and, and now we're going to talk about a lot of the different stuff. So before we get going, who is Adam Ringler? Man, that's, that's uh, yeah, you know, I, I wish I would have taken some notes and wrote some things down, but, you know, I think maybe just off the cuff is probably the easiest way of uh, getting sort of my authentic self. Um, Adam Ringler, right? So I've been a, a sports performance coach, strength conditioning coach, quasi sports sci, applied sports sci, whatever title you want to apply things. What, it, what ultimately what it is is that I just try to use data to inform and uh, to make decisions from it. So, you know, strength conditioning coach by trade. Spent the last 10, uh, 11 years as a SNC coach. And then dabbled a little bit more in technology and sports performance technologies and sports science probably over the last half of my career. Um, but man, I'm just uh, I'm just a guy trying to find solutions to otherwise sometimes complex problems and and try to think a little bit outside the box of uh, different modalities and methods to try to accomplish a task. I love it, brother. And in order to start running down those rabbit holes. At some point in your career, there was an epiphany that started to, to get things rolling. So describe for us a learning situation that brought about an, epi uh, an epiphany in your career. Yeah, man. So, you know, I think if I were to think uh, early in the beginning of my career, right, I was trying to do some things that was probably more from my selfish standpoint, right? So I think even if I were to backtrack a little bit, you know, I'm, a, I'm part of a generation that grew up, um, probably the last generation that grew up without sort of the digital digital component of computers, right? So I could still remember my early childhood of growing up being outside, not having the internet, and um, not navigating the World Wide Web and message boards, bulletin boards, things like that. And why I start with that is because um, so much of you know, of technology and so much of where sports performance is going and where it has gone 
has been um, into quantifying and, and trying to apply sort of technologies to performance. And why I wanted to start there is because, you know, I think very early in my career, very selfishly as well, I was trying to fit a solution to a problem that nobody was really trying or wanting to uh, to have answers to. So I think for an epiphany for me was that, you know, really trying to approach what I was going to do with the end result in mind, rather than trying to do things just because I thought they were novel or because uh, I wanted to do them. Um, you know, so really having a keen understanding of the sort of organizational readiness to adopt new technologies or new new ideas, ide ideologies or methods to doing things. I really went in like a bull in a china shop. I was just breaking a lot of different things because uh, because I thought there was a better way of doing things. And what I didn't do was really have a keen understanding of was our organization, was our systems, was the people around us really willing to adopt a new ideology, a new methodology to doing things. So, you know, I think very early in my career, I was, I was rather selfish into trying to accomplish these things and do these tasks and uh, accomplish these initiatives because I wanted to do it and not necessarily because the organization was demanding it. Um, and that's, I think that's just something you learn as you go through it and you go through your own sort of coaching journey, your own processes really trying to navigate your own career to, to uh, positions where both your own aspirations are in line with what the organizational readiness and the organizational goals are. I love the term organizational readiness. It fits right in with something we were just talking about. And I think that on top of being one of those people who grew up without iPhones, um, we've both been in that same situation where We've built things because they were great and they worked and they were helpful, but it wasn't as helpful as it was to what we were doing and maybe helpful to the bottom line as well. When people around you that you're working with and for aren't ready for it, it typically leads to disaster. Yeah, I mean, I mean, no doubt on that. Like it's a lot of the initiatives we were growing out while I think other organization. And, and this is part of the problem, I think, is, you know, one of the crux of social medias that we see is that we see practitioners and organizations doing some really incredible things to try to promote, you know, athlete performance or health and well-being. And then you look at those as common best practices and you start to say, well, wouldn't this be great in my organization? Maybe I should try to adopt some of these same methodologies or approaches to strength conditioning, physical preparation, all of those things. And, you know, because of that, you, you ruffle some feathers and you, you sort of challenge the status quo. And, you know, where we were at organizationally wasn't always where these other organizations are at. So it's, it's looking at what the best in the world do and the best in class does and thinking that you could just apply that to what your organization is. It'd be akin of looking at like the the physical preparation programs of elite athletes and thinking that you could apply that to a, a junior level kid or, you know, a youth kid going through adolescence. And like that couldn't be further wrong or couldn't be further farther from the truth of what we should do. And it's easy to just recognize that when you say, yeah, your uh, your 12 year old shouldn't be training like an elite athlete. That's not going to get them to that elite level of athleticism if you just copy a program, but also when you look at organizations, that's the same, same thing. Like you shouldn't just copy what the very best organizations are doing across the robe, uh, across the globe or across the world or across different sports and think that your organization will be successful because you're, you're utilizing the same strategies or approaches that they're taking. No doubt about it, man. Different strokes for different folks sometimes is what it comes back to, you know? Absolutely. So let's go to number two, brother. You're an inquisitive guy, so I'm excited to hear this. If you could ask just one question and you know that you would get the answer to that question, what would that question be and why? Hmm. How can I deliver value? And what I mean by that is that I think when you ask that question to an athlete, how can I deliver value? What do, what do you find valuable? How can I do that? How can I deliver that to you? Their response 
might be drastically different from person to person. What one person might need you to be and way to act and the way that you can service them might be very different than the next athlete, you know, standing two feet to the left or to the right of them. But then I look like across the organization, how can I deliver you value? What, what do you need from me? And that might be, again, might be different from sport program to sport program. It might be different from administrator to administrator. It might be different from one job, one position from another. So I think if we can start with that way of starting to understand what another person or an organization finds valuable, it's much easier to hit the target that you're trying to achieve. So, so often I think it's like, if you don't know where the bullseye is, you just keep shooting at targets and you might hit one and you might not know why, but if you can understand how I can deliver value as a person, then I think that it's much an easier, it's a much more direct path to actually fulfilling not only what you want to do and being successful and being fulfilled by doing that, but also by delivering what the other person needs. And we're in a service industry and at the end of the day, whether you're servicing your organization or your coaching staffs or the athletes. So I just think like the better that we get a clear picture of what success looks like for the individual or for the organization, the easier it is to point and, and paint maybe a, uh, a GPS device from one waypoint to the second waypoint, the much more clear path and direct path you can get from point A to point B. That's fantastic. I love that. I love the whole idea of delivering value as a Gary Vaynerchuk fan. How can I'm, you, how can yeah, you get man, 149, like, you know? <laughs> I'm a huge like Gary V fan. And like I, I you know, and yeah, there's a marking component of what Gary V does, right? But like at the end of the day, I think it's about what you can do for the customer. And we all have different customers that we serve. So it's better just know like, what what do you value and how can I get you there? And maybe I'm not the solution for your problem. But if I know that, then I can I, I can defer to another professional that can do that for you. I love it, man. But in order to, to deliver that value, you got to be able to be recharged, all in, ready to rock and roll at all times. So what's your escape? What does Adam do to get that recharge and, and kind of turn it off a bit? Man, that's, you know, hearing that question, I'm struggling with it because, you know, if I, if I were to be a little bit vulnerable here, um, I, I have had a terrible time of trying to find avenues and mediums to recharge, right? Had you asked me this maybe two or three years ago, I would say, you know, Jay, I'd probably, um, I meditate and I read and I relax and I would do jujitsu and get away. And, but here, here's the crux of it. Right. And, you know, there's been a number of other people that's talked about work-life balance and how it's not really a balance. It's, it's more ebbs and flows and trying to find avenues where yeah, it might be a little bit more chaotic at one period. And then you find the the flow where it's not right now. I, I feel like there's some projects that I'm working on that I'm insanely passionate about and that it is, uh, it, it's really taken me down this rabbit hole where I, I look at this as a, a very acute window of time where I can really do some really great work and try to do some things that are innovative. But the consequences of it is that I'm, I'm having a hard time finding avenues to actually relax and get away and, and recharge. Right? So, what I, I, I would say is that I'm hopeful um, that there's opportunities where I can get away, right? Like I'm, you know, just to juxtapose this to other things across the world, right? Like I, I, I'm obviously a father. I got two kids. I'm a, uh, a husband to a loving wife. And so I have a family component that I try to, you know, be as present for as much as I possibly can and love uh, each and every one of those. And at the end of the day, I just want to try to be the very best I can be at, in sort of the work dynamic that I, I work in, but also in the family dynamic that I live in. So I, I'm hopeful um, <laughs> that I can find a better avenue where I can be more present and be more recharged. But to be truthful, you know, I think there's two sides of this coin and, you know, this sounds terrible, uh, but I just wanted to, to illustrate, like even, even the best in the world and, and people that sometimes 
think that they can get everything together. They, I, I struggle with this and it is real and it is hard and it wears you down sometimes. And, and, you know, I think there's, there's great avenues and other professionals in the field, um, like Brett Bartholomew, who's talking about this with his, uh, continuing education courses and valued course. Um, that's, that's something I'm looking into because burnout's real and I don't want to go down that road and I'm recognizing the signs and symptoms of, uh, of what it's like to, to be, you know, frayed at some of the edges, but I'm also aware, like I have this small little moment of time where I'm trying to do this and get this thing up and running. And, uh, but let me tell you, I'm hoping once, once everything's good to go, that you'll find me on a beach with a, a mojito in one hand and my feet sitting up in a, in a hammock and, uh, kids are playing in the sand or in the ocean, man. That's a, that'd be a great dream or a great fantasy that I'm, I'm working my tail off to, uh, accomplish this. And then, uh, to make that a reality. I appreciate that, man. I really appreciate the candor because I think that a lot of people talk about things, but really they don't turn it off. So it, I, thank you, man. That's, that's big time. Yeah. Yeah. By all means, man, you know, like I, I should probably dedicate myself to doing headspace or calm or any one of these other meditative apps that I, I, I spoke about maybe two, three years ago prior to jumping into this um, initiative. But and maybe I need to maybe I need to go like I, I obviously have some mountains here that I can take some hikes on and we do that. But, you know, it, it really comes down to, I think, just discipline and really trying to have some self-discipline. And I need to try to find a better avenue of, of exercising that discipline when it comes to that headspace and that uh, that mental mental space to, uh, to recharge. So that's something I'm, I'm insanely, uh, aware of and trying to focus on not only in 2019, but this upcoming year as well. well that's awesome, man. And I appreciate that. And I appreciate you, Adam. Thank you so much for spending the time with us today, brother. This is killer. Awesome, man. Appreciate you as well. Yeah, man. We'll be in touch soon, buddy. Thank you. Hey, take care.